All right. Uh, hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, welcome back. I'm Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hi, everybody. This is Venkat, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa. And since I'm making a habit of eating uh, quarantine food with the right letter of the alphabet each time, today I'm eating dark russet potato chips. Venkat, are we on so D today? You're doing the letter D today, right? Great. Yeah, yeah we had a couple of things from C left over, but we can roll back to those after when we roll around the alphabet, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, great. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, do you think we should give a preview about what we're going to talk about, or should we just jump into it? Mm, yeah, why don't we list out the topics, and then we can sort of random access jump into them. Great. It sounds good. Okay, so for D, we have David Deutsch, which is double D, um, Deep Learning, Doja Cat, Dark Age, and Depression. Wow, all of these seem fairly topical, um, or at least, like, of the moment. Uh, should we start with, like, David Deutsch? Um, I feel like I like the David yes. Deutsch topic because I feel like it, um, like, we have kind of a nice history around it. I don't remember exactly how David Deutsch, you said you, I, I can't remember exactly if it was, I contacted you, but you said for some reason the fact that I know things about David Deutsch is the thing that like. Yeah, uh, I think because uh, David Deutsch has been on my radar for several years, but the older I get, the mm-hmm. lazier I get about reading like difficult authors who write about, you know, deep yeah. subjects. So whenever I find one that I put on my radar, I also start looking for somebody who has processed them a lot more deeply than I'm likely to. And then I kind of draft off what they know about them. So with you, since you'd already read about David Deutsch and written about mm-hmm. him, and you did the talk at Refactor Camp on okay, David yeah. Deutsch stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah, that was very useful for me, the way you kind of like uh, did the explainer on his thinking. But uh, yeah, you, 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 that's your pet topic. So tell us about David Deutsch. Yeah, so I think, okay, so David Deutsch, I think, sort of re-entered it's funny because I read his books before I had known that they were going to be popular if that makes sense and I feel like within the last three or four years David Deutsch has sort of researched in terms of like being a pop culture thinker like someone that other intellectuals kind of know more about um but at the time that I read him I don't even know anyway so David Deutsch is like well known for being a kind of vocal advocate and um, fairly persuasive thinker and writer who is a physicist um, in quantum quantum mechanics, like a subgroup of physics. Um, he did a lot of work extending on, I believe it was Hugh Everett or Howard Everett, Hugh Everett's multi-world Hugh interpretation. Everett. Yeah. Hugh Everett the third's multi-world interpretation of the quantum quantum mechanical mm-hmm. like experimental results. Um, which is to say that he David Deutsch did a I think he does a good job of laying out an argument for how um, the universe we exist in behaves like a multiverse, at least at the quantum level, um, and de- demonstrably at the quantum level. Um, I think that there's a lot of, I think you run into problems when you try and extend it beyond the quantum uh, level, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's one of those topics where there's this clear divergence between uh, like, um, science amateur fans and the professionals like when you talk to professional physicists to them the many worlds interpretation Mm -hmm. of quantum mechanics is the kooky minority viewpoint and not the standard view but when you talk to like people who love following pop science and uh, sort of having fantasies about it uh, we all love many worlds like i totally love many worlds and i want it to be true because it makes all the science fiction a lot more fun to (laughs) you know escape into so yeah i'm totally in on team many worlds 
and therefore many worlds yeah, yeah many worlds interpretation so it's actually interesting so david deutsch has written two pop i think what are considered like pop science novels right so like it's actually kind of interesting for a long time i didn't really understand what pop science meant and then i realized basically it meant non-technical papers um so like sitting down and writing like a book that's not a textbook is generally considered pop sci um his the first one he wrote was at the end of the 90s was called the fabric of reality and have there's like four different things that this book like deals with one is the multi-worlds interpretation um the other one of the four is like the uh i can't remember the exact term for it but it's basically like how science gets done i want to say like epistemology um and he uses like karl popper's works i can't exactly remember what popper's theory was but i think it had to do with popper has a theory about how academic um falsificationism right like popper is most known for falsificationism like that followed logical positivism but yeah okay so his second book was about epistemology so no this is all in the same this is all in the same book there's like oh, same covers, book. Okay. yeah for, but he covers he, okay. he covers four different fields and says like okay if we go out to like the farthest that we know in these four fields what does that say about reality as we know it which is why the book is called the fabric of reality um and the four fields he looks at is like the like science of knowing what we know the science of quantum mechanics which he's very familiar with um the science of computing which he uses i believe like kind of mm-hmm. turing's turing machine is like the basis of that particular branch and then the fourth one is darwinism biology um what do we know about the world being evolutionary um but it's interesting to me that like a lot of his like talks in the uh, epistemic um popper column was a lot around how and why like science updates and i feel like he uses a lot of that around so the um non the many worlds interpretation is one and then these the other it's called the copenhagen model um yep so th- those are just like the two names for i don't exactly know or understand what it means to be a copenhagen physicist i think a lot of that means that you don't make any pronouncements about what the experimental results mean about reality it means that you refuse to create explanations based on the on the quantum results and instead only based them on the classical and it's sort of this abnegation of responsibility as a physicist of creating explanations um wait 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 wait, wait. back up so you think there's a responsibility of physicists to create explanations that's kind of an interesting Right. And so this is like I think of it as a preference <laughs> like the way I think of physics is you have to make models and the only justification for the mo- I'm actually quoting James uh, Gleick I think in his book Chaos but something mm-hmm. like uh, the only justification for the models of physics is that they're expected to work like if they make accurate predictions that um, sort of, sort of yeah. work for you that's all that um, right. uh, live or die by you don't have to actually Come, come up with an explanation for what they mean. Right. And so this is, no, but this is what, okay, but this is what David Deutsch, this is why David Deutsch gets into the epistemology of science is because he says, no, coming up with a hypothesis is a, like the process of science is you come up with a hypothesis, your model is a narrative and it explains like a good narrative fits the most, you know, this kind of like an Occam's razor aspect of model creation, but part of doing science does involve coming up with hypotheses. So this aspect of Copenhagenism, which says we should not create hypothetical, like hypotheses around the broader implications. Anyways, I just think it's really interesting that like half of his book is about um, basically why multi-worlds is like the correct way of looking, not necessarily the correct way, but he spends a lot of energy explaining why Copenhagenism is like anti-scientific sort of. Um, so uh, I think um, yeah, this is kind of an old debate in science. Like I remember uh, the pop science books I read when I was a teenager writing that, that's before David Deutsch. Um, mm. They talked about how in the early days of quantum mechanics, the uh, contest was between de Broglie and I forget how to pronounce his name, de Broglie and uh, Heisenberg. And Heisenberg had the uncertainty principle and de Broglie had his de Broglie wavelengths and um, wave guided particles and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I think the, mm-hmm. yeah. there's almost a matter of taste there. It's, so explanation is one dimension of it, but the other 
uh, dimension of it is there's a temptation into it, there's a slippery slope going from like interpretation to analogy to allegory to ultimately you're dealing in like science fiction and i personally like going down that slippery slope but i'm kind of like very uh, i appreciate the arguments against it and uh, i like the idea of okay there's a way to do physics and science that's just do the math see what falls out of the equations go to the observations and then it's fun to like attach stories to them but it's also kind of like uh, important to stay focused on sort of the uh, i don't know phenomenology under the narrative as sort of the ground reality and sort of all right if many worlds is a fun interpretation but uh, I like to not get attached to it, even though I like it a lot. <laughs> right. But I think the point Deutsch tries to make is that our understanding of the world doesn't advance without better narratives and that the narrative creation process with data to back it up is part of how human understanding moves forward. Um, I think in the book, Fabric of Reality, he goes into the whole Galileo um, or Copernicus, I forget which one exactly had the, you know, we see, does the earth revolve around the sun or does, does the, uh, does, is the center, the earth, the center of the universe and everything else revolve around it? Copernicus. In, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Copernicus. In order for Copernicus to make sense of the data, he had to create a new model or narrative around what was happening. So he was making astrological, like observation, astronomical, astronomical observations. <laughs> they were the same thing back then so yeah yeah were i mean they? that's that's that story yeah i mean they were like um newton and kepler both dabbled in mysticism kepler had his three laws with which he had mystical interpretations based on you know the mm -hmm. five platonic solids so i think back then people still hadn't truly made sort of um the clear distinction which kind of dates more to the 19th century i think uh, but it's interesting that you bring up copernicus because Today, people kind of like have this false narrative around what happened then, which says that the Copernican model was simpler than the Ptolemaic model of Earth-centric. But it turns out that if you actually look at the details, it was not mm -hmm. actually the case because uh, Copernicus also had uh, circular orbits. And what happens is until you go to elliptical orbits, which is what Kepler did, you actually mm -hmm. don't simplify the mathematical model that much. Like whether mm -hmm. the Earth is at the center or the Sun is at the center, so long as you stick with circular orbits, you'll need epicycles. And what Kepler did was actually yes. violate the sort of platonic abstraction and beauty of circles and, you know, ellipses are a little more profane. So it was like, all right, mm. you're coming down from the heavens a little more earth and then the equations become simpler. So that actually reminds me of this book that I've been meaning to read. I, it's by, what's her name? Sabine Hassenfelder, I think. She's a contemporary working physicist. So she has this sort of... Um, uh, argument that physicists tend to get, um, I don't know, taken down the wrong path by being too attached to beauty. So they want beautiful models and beauty is like a good proxy for, you know, the Occam's razor um, compressive simplicity, but it can lead you astray. And um, mm -hmm. Hassenfelder's, I think I'm getting her name right. Her thing is, just do the math and if it gets ugly, it gets ugly, but you have to kind of follow that where it goes and not get sort of beguiled by beauty down into like, you know, super string theory, which is kind of everybody's favorite, uh, uh, I don't know, whipping boy for um, beauty without evidence. But anyway, I'm sort of digressing now, but okay. So uh, Deutsch also did uh, quantum computation stuff, right? So he's at the interface of uh, physics and quantum computation. He is. Yeah. I'm actually, um, I'm not, so I know that he, yes, he worked in the quantum computation. I believe he had contributions in the quantum computation field of research, but I'm going to be honest, I'm not hundred percent sure what they were. Um, I just quantum know. Mechanics possible. is one subject that I still don't know how to pretend I know anything about. That's my standards. Like I know about stuff. I'm, know how to pretend I know about stuff and then I don't even know how to pretend and <laughs> quantum computation is one of those I can't even pretend subjects. I, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Michael Nielsen and Andy Matuchek had a really long form article on 
like a primary for on is primary the right word primer, primer. yeah primer, yeah <laughs> <laughs> a oh, primer uh, on quantum primer? computation, which I thought I did a while ago now, which I thought was really good, but um, I don't know. And I think Scott Aronson writes a lot about it. You know that line they have about popular science, that the job of popular science is to make the reader feel like a genius? I think nobody has yet achieved that standard with explaining um, quantum computing. It's like mm-hmm. none of these things I've read has made me feel false and, and that, you know, surge of false enlightenment and feeling like I'm a genius, which I kind of expect from good science, uh, pop science writers. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Oh, I'd be curious. Of, uh, yeah, oh, go, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. Speaking oh, of. As, as speaking of physicists whose names end in D, one of the books I'm reading now is called The Starship and the Canoe by a guy named uh, Kenneth Brower. It's a truly awesome book. I've been live tweeting it on um, uh, Twitter, but it's about the uh, physicist Freeman Dyson and his son, George Dyson. So Freeman Dyson is a guy who came up with the concept of a Dyson sphere. Are you familiar with that? So that's the idea that a sufficiently advanced civilization is going to attempt to capture all the energy from its parent sun. So it'll create like a sphere around its star and capture all the energy. And therefore, one way to look for alien civilizations is to go looking for uh, suspiciously dim looking stars that also seem to have a planet around them that are radiating a lot in the near infrared. So that's Freeman Dyson. And he also came up with um, the concept of a nuclear propelled rocket, which was Project Orion in the 50s. They actually built uh, like proof of concept versions of these nuclear propelled rockets. And he came up with a bunch of starship concepts. So that's the elder Dyson and his son, George Dyson is a historian, but he built like uh, kayaks and canoes based on like Native American models and spent years in the wilderness. So and I just wanted to throw that book out there for people who are looking for a good quarantine read. Starship and Canoe, the Dyson family. Oh, okay. that sounds cool. Ah, anyway, so what else about David Deutsch? What interesting things do we, should we know about him? What more things are there to know about Deutsch? Um, he wrote another book. I think he's only ever written two pipe pop sci feels so bad to call them that because I don't know. But he only wrote two popular science books, um, or gen- maybe gen- general audience, gen pop. Um, the other one is called The Beginnings. I, of I like popular science as a genre. Yeah, I know, but I it's just, a good term. <laughs> pop science just feels so like diminutive. We should get into this if we talk when we talk about Doja Cat. Um, the yeah. um, yeah, I, I can't. I can never remember what Beginning of Infinity is about. I know I've seen people read it and seem to like it better than the fabric of reality. But to me, the fact that I don't have a good framework for what it was concerning is concerning. I don't know. Hey, so, what was the second book? The second book is called the Beginning Beginning of Infinity. Okay. Um. Yeah. What's it about? Exactly. I have no idea. Um, I couldn't tell you. I feel like he takes like, I feel like he takes certain threads that he started in the fabric of reality and like elaborates on them in different ways, particularly the computing one, but I can't actually remember because I read them at the same time. It's fine. We'll have to circle back next time we hit D and if you've read the book by then you can explain it to us. Um, Yeah, maybe Uh, we'll just go read the table of contents and re-figure out which exactly, but yeah. Um, uh, what is the title again? Beginning of Infinity or something? Yeah, The Beginning of Infinity. So that oddly enough reminds me of probably the first pop science book I ever read. It was by George Gamow. It was called One, Two, Three to Infinity. So these topics seem to um, circle and cycle back. All right. Yeah. So on the topic of pop science, I mean, we can also, I think, so Doja Cat was on the list of topics and that. I put her on there as like a, do you know who Doja Cat is? Do you mean Doggy the Shiba Inu dog or? No. I don't know who Doja Cat is. What is that? Doja Cat is a singer, pop artist. Um, She's a pop culture, I'm going to call her pop culture icon. She's like relatively new. I think she's started singing within the last two or three years, maybe a little bit longer than that, but she's like fairly new. and. interesting and 
hang on. I I've like wrote some notes on our thing, legibility. Oh, that's right. So I, was, I wanted to like talk kind of about the legibility of pop culture in terms of like, um, I feel like certain like, so singers like Doja Cat, for example, kind of make like an interesting, not even like test, but like there's something about popular culture, right? So like I would say Doja Cat's pop culture and that she's part of culture because of her popularity in certain subsets, right? Um, but to some extent, like how popular, like the measure of popularity kind of constrains the how legible that person is to people outside of that bubble, if that makes sense. Um, maybe I'm like kind of- so I've never heard of her, so clearly she's not legible to me. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, but if you, but to people who do know who she is, like, it kind of like the people who know about Doja Cat to some extent that tells you something about what cultures or popularity cultures that they are like a part of or a member of or a group, like whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, this is true of like pretty much anything that a set of people know that don't, but um, I don't know. I just like pop culture is um, it's, I guess they're all like signifiers, but it's like the reason that they're, the reason that they're a thing of culture is because of their popularity, but they're not, it's not like popularity is not like all encompassing. It always has like a boundary to it. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I think you, you have a mix of a sort of pejorative idea of what pop culture is and a definition mm -hmm. of what it is that I think isn't quite right. To me, pop culture is simply anything that um, kind of is, lends itself to dissemination by mass media in a way that, large masses of people can access it. It doesn't per se say anything mm -hmm. about its quality or anything. Like, um, uh, like back when printing was not a thing and you needed illuminated manuscripts, only the very rich could afford to get manuscripts and therefore uh, books were not pop culture. But the moment like cheap printing became sort of a thing, books became pop culture. So there's an, there's an aspect of pop culture that's simply low cost dissemination of the thing, right? So pop science too, like back when Einstein came up with relativity, some people said that only five people in the world could understand what relativity means. But now it's like every college grad takes a course in like undergrad physics and kind of has an idea what relativity is. Anybody can learn it for, for free from Wikipedia, right? So uh, that aspect of pop culture, I yeah, think- hang on, about the gun. Okay. Hang on, I gotta pause. Sorry, I'm gonna like pause for a second. Okay. Sorry, I have to go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's the element of pop culture that's simply cheap dissem dissemination through mass media. And then there's the element of pop culture that's mm. kind of more the cultural valences of, you know, classical music is like elite and highbrow and it takes like a very refined and cultivated taste to appreciate it. Versus pop culture is something that people with mediocre or poor tastes can appreciate, right? right. So it's that right, distinction right, I think okay. that you're getting at. Yeah, a little bit. And so I think like that whole, and that whole thing of like pop culture being like of the masses. So, okay, there's two things here. One is like pop culture is usually seen as of the masses and therefore not as good of quality, um, which is interesting. And I think that that's why I have a bad reaction to the term pop science is because I think that it denotes a certain like de- um, I do you like kind of like a removal of um, quality, like a, a degra degradation in the quality of the information because of the fact that it is targeted, because of the audience that it's targeted at, um, which I don't think is, well, I don't think that's true um, to like the, like the. I mean, not only, like I agree with you that it's not true and I think it's actually 90% of the time that kind of attitude is just plain snobbery it's not based on any meaningful um, considerations of like either aesthetics or intellectual quality or anything. It's just plain snobbery, but that's just, uh, I should just declare my biases up front. I'm like extremely pro uh, like middle brow summer blockbustery sensibilities. And I kind of mm. tend to try and find sort of the, I don't know, hidden merit in that and try to understand why certain things capture the popular imagination and what that means. And um, so uh, to me, actually things get more interesting when they get mass appeal and uh, have this sort of deceptively simple seeming sort of either 
taste front or sort of scientific intelligibility front, right? So to me, that's a mark mm-hmm. of actually arrival and success and quality in a different sense than uh, subcultural snobs, honestly. That's the way I think of them. Subcultural snobs, ideas of what quality is, is like the polar opposite of what my idea of quality is. Okay, that's my mini rant mm. on <laughs> uh, class and aesthetics. But uh, okay, so let's uh, go back to Doja Cat. Uh, oh. Oh, I wanted... Uh, I want to go back to like your dissemination argument. And I think that the dissemination argument. Okay. So I think that social media makes the dissemination argument hard to divorce from raw popularity slash virality, if that makes sense, because to some extent, like, you know, it's like kind of, you get into like the psychology of why do people share things? Um, which I don't know if this was necessarily the case of media before social media maybe a little bit um particularly around music like how did radio djs decide what to play um how i'm not exactly sure exactly how much of like mixtape culture dictated what people listened to it seems like it was more dictated by what was played on the radio um so um, i think there's actually a very interesting techno cultural history there like if you look back at the history of uh, radio one of the pioneers was uh, lady forest And he is credited with inventing the triode, but he doesn't kind of deserve the credit because he kind of like fake disclaim and stuff. But anyway, he was one of the original founding fathers of radio. And when he came up with the first sort of radio broadcasts, um, he kind of like thought it would be a way to send classical music out to the masses and like popularize, you know, classical symphony orchestra type music. But what ended up happening, and this surprised him and a lot of early radio pioneers was that instead of making classical music more popular, it simply uh, triggered a new kind of music, which is like, um, it, it wasn't like the older folk music of like peasants, but neither was it like the high culture of uh, elites taken down to middle brow tastes. That, that's where you, uh, you, know, you ended up with like true pop music of, uh, uh, which we think of as pop music today, like Elvis Presley and people like that. That started with the medium being the message and that was how kind of like radio created its own form of music. And I think it's a mistake to try and like uh, compare that to uh, things that exist in other media like symphony halls, right? So there's almost like it's a category error to compare things like that. Like mass media. I see, yeah. Because, well, I mean, in a lot of ways, like the Elvis origin story was that he played in his bedroom. um, Gosh, I can't remember the name. There's like a really great, two book biography of Elvis that I read a couple years ago. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but um, he, in it, it talks about basically Elvis Presley's like rise to fame is very similar to kind of how you imagine um, internet pop stars because he, he didn't go out and play a bunch of local shows. He went to a, he like got a demo tape recorded basically and took it to a radio host who loved it and played it. And then he became super popular over radio, but Elvis Presley didn't really start. He would, he wasn't like a, it wasn't like he went around and played a bunch of shows and built like a, like grassroots audience. Right. He went straight to the source of broadcasting, which is very similar to like how, well, and this is where like I kind of struggle, right. It's like, how did radio host announcers you know it was good versus like today we kind of ah uh, i see what you're getting at so there's almost like the, there's a trajectory of maturation of um, mass media where in the early days it kind of uh, just borrows um, tricks from whatever came before so elvis for example a lot of his music is inspired by black music pre-radio right gospel, and then yeah, um, yeah mm-hmm. gospel and church music and that's a form of music that had its as its medium physical buildings and churches uh, and he went on radio but if you look at the most modern sort of um, music cultures you've gone to the other extreme of things like k-pop for example which is large corporations talent scouting and identifying you know good looking young people in korea and carefully mm-hmm. grooming them through almost a finishing school to produce these extremely manufactured kinds of musical cultures. And, and the interesting thing is um, this thing also sort of triggers its own second wave dynamics. Like I remember this, I forget the name of the author, but the book is called The Birth of Korean Cool. And it's about K-pop mm-hmm. and everything that the government did. 
And as it happens, Gangnam Style, which is the song that sort of broke out of Korea and brought Korean culture worldwide, that's actually not a product of the pop hit making machine of Korean culture. It's not, you know, a machine product that's in Korean culture that was like almost a subversive um, sort of um, satire against the machine. And apparently you would only understand this if you speak Korean. I don't know, but I've been to that uh, part of Seoul, the um, Gangnam area, which he raps about. And Mm -hmm. it's full of like, uh, I don't know, uh, preppy, annoying, posturing people who kind of represent the factory of uh, pop industry. But I think that, that trajectory is kind of interesting where there is an aspect to pop culture which gets not necessarily tasteless, but sort of, I think we have to make a distinction between popularity and mass appeal versus commercialization. Like there's a point of uh, popularity and mass appeal at which the sort of taste matrix, so to speak, of the product becomes legible to corporate interests. And they're like, oh, we get the formula now. and Therefore, we can create a factory to produce things according to the formula. And I think there I would agree with both you and the subcultural critics as that late stage of a cultural sort of movement is when it goes to die. Because once the commercial interests know how to turn it into a mass formula. Yeah. Right. Does that sort of theory work for you? Yeah, I think it does work. Yeah. I still think we're kind of like dancing around the core issue that I have around like, what does it mean to be popular in 2020 culturally? Um, In terms of like in 1950, when Elvis got on whatever, um, got on the radio, to some extent, the audience that he had to impress was the radio disc jockeys as an audience. Mm -hmm. Um, and if he was able to appeal to them, and I'm not sure what, I don't know what like disc jockeys used as their criteria for spotting hits, right? Or making hits. Um, but I feel like today's I age, mean, we can guess at that, right? I mean, taste makers and cultural gatekeepers have always been kind of the same through the ages. Like they mm-hmm. are gatekeepers to a leveraged yeah. mechanism of distribution. And they all vary in range from like, arrogant jerks who have no taste but sort of impose their um, control of a scarce commodity all the way to really sort of uh, plugged in and tuned in people with uh, really good tastes who are like a year ahead of the pop tastes and can actually scout and promote talent before it's ready right so you have the range it's like vcs it's like vcs investing in startups you've got these gatekeepers investing in cultural products yeah but i don't think that it's that but the I guess I'm trying to say that, like, so I guess Doja Cat, as an example, I really got to fame based on the work that she did in terms of, like, YouTube, like, videos, like, her music videos that she put out. I mean, her stuff's also really good, personal opinion. Um, But I think that, like, she didn't have to go through, like, a gatekeeper, right? The gatekeeper was she went straight to, like, the audiences and to some extent relied on... Did she, though? I mean, the gatekeeper was the algorithm, wouldn't you say? Like YouTube has a feed algorithm that sort of Uh, modulates and rewards certain behaviors more than others. Right. But let's say that the algorithm in this sense is agnostic to the content, right? It's just like it follows like the behavior of the humans interacting with the content. I'm not so sure about that. Like I'm not a big music listener, but I I do have experience uh, with blogging, which has a similar dynamic, right? And there was Mm -hmm. always this tension, at least when I was starting to blog in like 2007 to 12 or so of, are you writing for the machine, which is, you know, search engine optimized um, headlines, particular, very predictable clickbaity things, or are you actually writing for a particular kind of human? Mainly, are you writing for yourself or like a Mm -hmm. clearly identified audience? And that's actually been a line I've always been sort of... uh, going throughout my blogging career, like especially once Twitter came online, the formula, we were talking about the commercializable formula that became obvious to me around 2012. Like I knew how to do clickbait and like deliver the clickbait type of hits around 2012, I'd figured it out. And at that point I had a fork in the road of, 
do I want to actually grow ribbon farm into like a Vox or BuzzFeed type of thing where I actually work the formula continuously and try mm-hmm. to hits? Or do I continue to actually write what I actually like writing myself and hope that people want to read it? And I took one road and therefore my blog had a particular slow trajectory, but lots of other people around that time, they took the other path. And so I think the same is true of music. It's like the, there's a, you know, the medium has a message and the message includes kind of a gatekeeping message, even if the gatekeeper is not a human. So I'm kind of a skeptic of the idea that media has been democratized and there are no gatekeepers. There's always a gatekeeper. (laughs) <laughs> I think it's interesting that it sounds like you had, it seems like you as a human person had this opportunity to turn yourself into the factory and you decided not to become the commercialized factory of yourself. Um, yeah. I mean, this was very obvious and clear because my first hit, um, so there's actually a gatekeeper involved there as well. So when I wrote the Gervais principle, which is the article I'm most famous for, this was in 2009, Mm -hmm. It got picked up by a gatekeeper, Keith Dawson, who was one of the mods of uh, Slashdot. He put it on Slashdot and therefore it got Slashdotted, which was a thing back then. Slashdot is no longer as important as an aggregator, but it got Slashdotted. Part two got Slashdotted. So A, there was a gatekeeper even there, the gatekeeper of the aggregator. Second, immediately that revealed the formula. Like right after that, I got request after request saying, do what you did for the office, but for XYZ, my favorite show. So people were asking me, can you do the same kind of treatment for The Wire? Can you do it for Mad Men? Can you do it for Game of Thrones? Can you do it for blah, blah, blah? And I was like, I could obviously turn this into a shtick because it's not that hard. It's not like genius level work. Once I figured out that you take a TV show and its characters and plots and sort of have this sort of satirical analysis of like uh, psychology through that lens, it's a sort of guaranteed way to deliver traffic. And I could have gone down that route and I did kind of like flirt around it a couple of times and it proved the concept. But I was like, I don't really want to be cranking the handle on this damn formula for 10 years, even if that means I could be like a 10x bigger blog. And I think there's um, the people who make the choice to do that. I think they're the ones that attract the true hatred of the subcultural types who think that there's kind of a betrayal of... uh, I don't know, an artistic mission there or something. So I, I don't know that I saw it as a potential for betrayal. I didn't go down that path simply because it sounded boring to me. Like I didn't want to do the same kind of writing over and over. It was just a boring prospect. So um, I think that's the test. Like even with the music scene, there must be musicians. I don't know if um, Doja Cat is one of them who come to that fork in the road and ask, do I want to repeat the formula and grow big with it? Or do I want to keep sort of pushing the frontier and keep myself interested. So uh, what is she doing? Like, is she at the fork, past the fork? I wouldn't know, I'm going to be honest. I like, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't know. I think one thing that's interesting about Doja Cat is that um, I think she's done, not, I wouldn't know if they call it the crossover. I, I'm so bad at remember particulars, but there's a particular like, um, so like TikTok as a formula, like as a thing is usually like a small snippet, let's say 20 seconds of a song. So it's like kind of like, it's almost like you were talking about how when you write an article, you need like hooks and like SEO sort of thing. Um, I would say that in this day and age that you need like a single phrase, like a phrase, a musical phrase that lends Mm -hmm. itself to TikTokization really well. Um, And Doja Cat, I can't, I don't, I have to go and look exactly which song and what clip and like there's like whole dance that goes with it and it's been super popular on TikTok. Like there's like kind of like a subset of them um, that that's like kind of becomes the way of rising to popularity and like Doja Cat managed to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think that necessarily answers your question about like replication. I think the real question there is that if her song, if you, if like after this, I would be interested to see or like, I think it would take some time to kind of go through her works before and after like this particular TikTok song to see if they try and mimic the same phraseology, if that, not necessarily like phraseology, but like trying to be popular and that lend themselves well to being used on TikTok. Um, I don't know. When did she break out with this uh, little TikTok musical phrase moment? When was this? I want to say this TikTok. So I think she's been fairly large before that, but I think the TikTok thing was within like the last four months. 
Okay. And if I remember correctly about the productivity of musicians, I mean, <coughs> an album a year is like a pretty good productivity rate, right? So that's like 10 or 12 songs that they might break out with. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the era of musician that Doja Cat is in is that they don't really make albums so much. So, so much. Singles. So how often do they release songs? Like, I don't listen to much music at all. So how often do modern musicians release new work? I'm not the person asked to answer that question, but I think, that, <laughs> I think Doja Cat is fairly, like, she comes out with new work fairly frequently, but it tends to be around, like, there tend to be, like, music videos attached to every piece when they come out. I don't know if that's normal. I wouldn't know if, like, you release a song and you already have the music video, like, ready to go. Like, that's part of what you're releasing. Um, that sounds like quite a lot of production. Yeah. yeah, but that's, like, part of the the whole song production is also this, like, um, like, the music video is, like, some interpretation of how to interpret the song or, like, I don't know. It definitely yeah. – I think that's, like, a whole separate conversation about, like, the narrativization of musical – pop culture embedded in the music videos that these artists produce. Um, Speaking of that, though, the production effort, um, there is one qualification I want to make to my sort of formula moment. Like when you're writing essays mm-hmm. and you discover a formula, repeating the formula is not that hard because you're a single person writing a thing. But with something like a song, I think the formula can get a lot more complex and you have to give credit to the people who work the formula. Like there was this uh, uh, New York Times detailed essay on how the song, uh, what is it, Meet Me in the Middle or something, the thing that was popular a while back. It was a very detailed breakdown of like the year long process. It took Mm -hmm. like refine that, like somebody came up with the musical idea, a bunch of people threw it around and brainstormed it, went through iteration after iteration. And when it actually came out, it became this huge hit. Mm -hmm. And I listened to that song when it came on the radio and it was it was a good catchy song, but um, as a non-expert, I don't think I could appreciate the depth of effort that went into sort of hitting that perfect note of catchy sort of memorability. And I I kind of appreciate that. Let me put it that way. Like uh, I appreciate the craft and sort of technical mastery that it takes to produce something that has the potential to be popular with a billion people. And this is something again, that I think Mm -hmm. subcultural snobs don't understand Mm -hmm. as a single artisan creator. It's easy to like find 50 people to impress with something you do, because almost anything you do, if you distribute it widely, widely enough there, you will find like 50 to, you know, 500 people who will appreciate it, but getting like a significant chunk of all of humanity, like, you know, a billion people to listen to a song and say, Hey, that's a catchy song. That's, an impressive feat, and I'm willing to sort of give props to that. Yeah, makes sense. That's funny. Yeah. It's like, so just to like touch really quickly on this like song production thing, there was a, so like, it's off, it's pretty, like, as you mentioned, it's pretty frequent for pop culture artists, especially established ones, to have teams of people who help create songs, popular songs. Um, and one pretty famous, like, I don't know the particular term for like the songwriter or like, jingle maker um her name's sia s-i-a um and she recently i want to say it was a profile in the new yorker um where she talks about how they're like sia how do you come up with all she's like very prolific um she comes up with jingles all the time and she talked about how she like came up with a jingle in like 20 minutes and that was like some really popular song that like made millions of dollars or whatever and you know it was kind of one of those like i feel like when she said that I don't remember exactly how the interviewer reacted to it, but it was kind of like this, like, you can't admit that you just spent 20 minutes on this thing. Like, how, like, that's not, like, you need only to, I mean, yeah, she's like, you know, she has decades of experience of writing music, so it's reasonable to expect her to be able to produce a thing that matches a pattern in 20 minutes and to be successful. I think, like, someone who's first starting out, that would be incredible. Uh, I mean, it's still incredible, but... Yeah, I think it's funny how there is kind of a, not expectation, but like to a certain extent, I don't know, the amount of time you put into a song is like hard. Yeah, I I think you're bringing up something very interesting, which is if you spend whatever 10,000 hours or something mastering a medium and including everything that goes with the medium, which is the production technology, maybe the team you have to work with. Mm -hmm. I think the test of a mature artist is, 
can you sort of take that experience and that sort of command of like a very complex production system and still stay artistically on top of it? Or do you become slave to the formula machine? And I think that's what separates the greats from the not so greats. Like Sia actually, I, I, like I said, I don't listen to much music, but I know her name because uh, there's an intersection with what we were talking about last time, which is cartoons. So in South Park, there's an episode arc where it's totally ridiculous where they basically pretend that um, the New Zealand uh, young girl Lord, uh, they pretend that um, mm. Randy, the character in South Park is secretly Lord and is producing the music and producing the songs and the fake Lord songs that they attributed to Randy slash uh, Lord in South Park were actually written and sung by Sia. And they're actually really good. So if you watch those South Park episodes, they're a lot of fun. And it's like, <laughs> Not only can she like credibly imitate com a completely different musician, she can do so in this sort of satirical context. And that was like, that impressed me that that could be done because after I listened to her songs on South Park, I went and listened to some Lord songs. And I was like, oh, actually, yeah, they sound close. Like she's actually pulled it off. Like, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could imitate yeah. the voice of another writer as well. Yeah, so I think, okay, so basically I think we've come up with the, we've re reached the conclusion that C is a genius, um, like, like, and the geniuses exist and are, like, recognizable as such because their work becomes super popular, maybe, I don't know, at least in the pop music, at least in the pop music. Yeah, and they managed to, like, I... I think the whole pop music conversation and taste and subcultures versus mainstream, I think where I am landing is sort of a very simple test. Is it, uh, are you the master of the formula or are you the slave to the formula? It's as simple as that. If you are the master of the formula, you're artistically productive and interesting. If you're a slave to a formula, you're no longer interesting. At least that's, that sort of summarizes my reaction to a lot of things I consume. Mm, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's a distinction that can, um, it seems like a distinction that is kind of like nebulous to apply, if that makes sense, because I could see how someone could be a master of a formula and then later become the slave to it, right? Like, it's not like a distinction that you win necessarily and then keep that title forever. It's a application that you can, or like a question you can ask yourself for every new like production or output, right? Like, yeah. And uh, you can sort of, uh, you have to kind of like take reactions to people's work sort of as part of the data. Like, you know, there's always this perception of when a very niche artist becomes mainstream successful, there is going to be a bunch of early fans who accuse that person of selling out or, you know, giving into the formula. But just because people make the accusation doesn't mean that it's actually true, right? Like, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan is an example. Like he did a bunch of little smaller scale movies that were critically acclaimed. And then he became this big mainstream star with the Batman trilogy. And a lot of people sort of had that reaction. And to me, it's like, all right, he's always stayed creatively interesting. You kind of just have to judge his work by different standards as his, you know, the phase of his career moved from like early precocious filmmaker to somebody aiming at the summer blockbuster market. And that has different ways of evaluating success and, mastery of the medium it's not that he became slave to the formula it was that he was working a different formula right that makes sense yeah working a different formula yeah it's complicated it's hard to judge i don't know it's like there's just a lot of yeah. uh, a lot, a lot i of get into things. this argument a lot with uh, people who have snobby subcultural tastes to be honest mm -hmm. it's like i'm always willing to give the artist the benefit of doubt for like seeking a bigger audience and trying something different and working a different formula. I'm always giving to willing to give them a benefit of a doubt. And I do not like artists who become not just slaves to a formula, but slaves to a particular sort of culture of taste or sensibility or slaves to a particular kind of audience. Uh, that, that's one mm -hmm. reason I don't like Patreon, like, you know, people who fund themselves to Patreon. It's a way, it, it's a nice sort of, service to help artists support themselves but it's also one that empowers the audience to the point where the creator has sort of a temptation to let the audience drive their choices which mm -hmm. i think is a very dangerous path to go down anyway that's just my rant <laughs> 
There's something there, though, when you're talking about the snobs that I think, like, I think one thing about snobbishness in particular that, like, makes it so kind of not necessarily persuasive, but, like, not persuasive, uh, like, prevalent or, like, um, and I think my, like, my thing with snobs is that they've set conditions around their um, admiration, if that makes sense. Like, it's conditional admiration. It's only if that artist continues to support some aspect of themselves that they've defined themselves through. They've used this artist mm-hmm. to define themselves, define aspects of themselves. And as soon as the artist, like, disallows them to, like, to see themselves through that lens, if that makes sense. Like, an example, yep. maybe this is more concrete, but it's like, oh, I like these niche artists. Um, because I like artists that are niche, I am something more, some, some aspect of like a niche artist makes me a, something I like about myself. And as soon as one of those artists no longer becomes niche, then you no longer can like yourself for like a niche artist because the artist you like is no longer niche. It's sort of complex, but like, I think, I think the basic picture is there, but I think my whole issue with that is that you're not actually appreciating the artistic work then if you're, it's not like a pure appreciation. It's not a pure aesthetic appreciation. It's a appreciation that like depends. Oh, yeah, on... You're just looking at your Jungian shadow, basically. Yeah, exactly. You're yeah, you're seeing your Jungian shadow in the artist's work, and when they dare to sort of disrupt your perception of your shadow, you start to hate them. Uh, in a way, that's um, uh, uh, this is kind of a harsh judgment, but people who kind of like de- develop extremely refined tastes around an, a, a creator's work, mm. often they are more slave to the formula than the creator themselves is. And this is part of the phenomenon of mm. there are certain sort of and a critical sensibilities that can understand a creator's work better than the creator can themselves. Like I sometimes occasionally sense this, that people legitimately can read more into something I've written than I intended to put in there. And I re- read the reaction and or I'm like, yeah, this is, you, I was thinking that maybe, but I mean. Well, it's, it's kind of like you in television shows, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, but I think I am that kind of fan of uh, mainstream television shows, but I think where I draw the mm-hmm. line is I don't set myself up as an authority to dictate to them what they should do. Like I'm a huge fan of Rick and Morty and Rick and Morty's um, producer, uh, at one point, he kind of like basically got pissed off at a bunch of his fans for being, I don't know, basically obnoxious, uh, whatever. And he basically said, screw you, I don't want you as fans. And I was like, I agree with that. And I was like, if you want to take the show in a different direction, whether or not I appreciate it, I will try to update my appreciation. And if I can't get it, it's your work. You take it where you want to go. And I think that's kind of a healthy attitude to have towards work. Where it gets into like toxic fandom is where you kind of like, I don't know, get mad and turn dictatorial as a consumer when the work deviates from whatever you've, like you said, attached yourself to, like projected your identity onto. So that's kind of the toxic relationship. Yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting though, because it unpins itself from the work product exactly, right? Like it sounds like every time an artist puts out a new work, you're prepared to reevaluate the work based on your own criteria. Um, Yep. Which is work. That's a lot of work. Thank yeah, at this point, right? Like, uh, hmm? as if that's a oh, lot of work. Oh. <laughs> uh, wait, uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to talk about a um, quick closing thought on that topic. Um, Disney uh, child stars, right? Isn't that almost like a cliche coming of age, you know, rite of passage where you're this really. Uh, I don't know, innocent child music star. And then at some point you do this uh, really provocative uh, R-rated music video. And then, I mean, that's the Britney Spears story, Miley Cyrus, all those people. It's like they've almost turned that into a cliche rite of passage. I mean, to completely change the like work product output that they're yeah. engaging in. And the perception and the identity that you've kind of created for others to identify with. So if anybody liked your sort of pure as driven snow identity and they were attached to it, you're basically saying, screw that and seeking out a different older audience. And you see that a lot. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's more to say here. What else do we have on our list? We have a lot more stuff, but I feel like we've... (laughs) 
we've gone we still have deep learning the dark age and depression um but maybe we should save those for another time yeah how how long have we been yeah i think we went down this big bunny trail but it was an interesting one no i i want to let's spend two minutes on dark ages though Um, i just put the topic on there um, right now because i feel like (laughs) Since we are living through pandemic times, every episode should have at least a two-minute segment that's relevant to the pandemic. And I think one of the interesting questions is, is this the beginning of a dark age? <laughs> what do you think? Yes, now. I think Jane Jacobs would agree with you. I think uh, okay. her last book she ever published was called Dark Does Age. Does Lisa agree with me? Huh? Does so Lisa I agree, agree with you? me? <laughs> I think we've been in a dark age. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> So, but I think yeah, this is I, the, I think this is the pop culture um, moment of the dark age. Totally, it's it's also one of those things that I'm sort of attracted to in narrative terms because it's um, like one of my favorite science fiction things is the Foundation series by Asimov, and there the whole premise is that there's a thirty thousand year dark age in the galaxy, and the Foundation is created to try and shrink that to a thousand years, and I think with that mental model a lot, like depending on what you do, the dark age could be in our more human, like terrestrial scales, it could be like a hundred years or 10 years. So anyway, dark age, depression. All right. Do you think we're in a, wait, did you answer this question? Do you think we're in a dark age? I think we have a choice to make now. We could end up in a dark age or we could either shorten it drastically or keep it um, or avoid it altogether, depending on the choices we make as uh, a society, global society in the next few years, actually. Like how we respond to the next few years starting with this pandemic will determine whether it's a 500 year dark age or 50 year dark age or just a five year depression. You think now is crunch time, like this is the time. Yeah, because one of the things I think that's happening is, this is very weird, but a lot of the actions that uh, people in the climate action and climate change world have wanted, are sort of almost automatically happening on an accelerated, more urgent schedule as a response to the pandemic. So in a way, this is a a dress rehearsal for a climate action response. So in that sense, something very interesting is happening. So yeah, this is crunch time. Yeah, yeah, I've got, oh, we should talk about energy. Oh, A is next. We should talk about energy next time. A for energy, there we go. I have some very dark thoughts about that, Um, yeah. Wait, you're in Houston on the oil economy, aren't you? So energy. <laughs> oh, I am. oil prices I think I have, have crashed. More. Yeah, oh, we have to talk about energy next time. Crashed oil prices and Houston real estate. Yeah, it hasn't it hasn't been long enough to know what the real estate anyway is. Yeah. I, we're at the tip of an iceberg, I think. And no one knows which direction the iceberg goes or how deep it is or how big it is. Um yep. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. All right. Well, Venkat, it's always a pleasure. Um, listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another um, another episode of Scorpio Season. All right. Thanks, Venkat. All right. Mm, bye-bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one-hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. We're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Great. Um, And if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.